We're on. We're on here. Is this true? I am on the air. I just want to read a little something to you. My name's C. Pembroke, Andy, Nay, Frankie, 14850. I'm doing this as a favor to no one in particular. And in fact, I'm not even in the mood to be doing this. But sometimes it's just that way. And a way become way isn't the perennial way. A name become name isn't the perennial name. The named is the mother to the 10,000 things. But the unnamed is origin to all heaven and earth. In perennial non-being, you see mystery. And in perennial being, you see appearance. Though the two are one and the same, once they arise, they differ in name. One and the same, they're called dark enigma. Dark enigma, deep within dark enigma, gateway of all mystery. Why then these objects? Well, we have crap around our houses, don't we? We all have crap around our houses. Hear that? That's some of the crap that's around my house. It's a guy named Greg Seeschlag, as I remember. And he said he was going to go to Nashville rather than pursue a career in banking. And I don't know what happened to him. But he gave me his CD, and this must have been eight or nine years ago, and I still have it. Greg, here's to you. I'm sipping from a tiny bottle of Panex Ginseng Extract. Why? Because I read about it somewhere, and because it doesn't have alcohol in it anymore. I'm interested in products and different kinds of products and what's in them. For instance, I went to the food pantry just a couple weeks ago. The food pantry is an interesting place because even though everything is being given away for free, people still complain about it. And while you can live on a can of cut yams for a little while, guess what's inside of this? We all know that yams are pretty sweet root tubers, right? The ingredients in this can include sweet potatoes, water, corn syrup, and sugar. I said sugar. I said, sugar! And I've also brought with me, because of my problems with allergies and frequent cold symptoms as a result of living in a climate such as ours, something called Dayquil. Dayquil mucus control, to control my mucus. What's in this stuff? Too many things, folks, too many things. And do you know what the healthiest thing is inside of this Dayquil bottle, folks? High fructose corn syrup. That's right. In this particular case, the healthiest thing for you is the high fructose corn syrup, as opposed to the yams in the can. In which case, the high fructose corn syrup and sugar are the least healthiest things. Now, why did I bring a Galilean thermometer with me? I don't know. I needed something comfortable and familiar to me while I did this because allegedly this show is about... Allegedly this show is about... It's supposed to be about meaninglessness, but I don't think there's any such thing as meaninglessness because the very effort to create non-meaning means that you're doing something to not mean anything. There was a Dada movement at one time and it was against things that had form and shape and it was an anti-romantic movement. I don't know if it can still be said to have any legs these days. 
Even so, one of my favorite things in the world is to read the obituaries in the back of The Economist magazine. They are some of the best written obituaries that you'll find anywhere. This particular obituary I just grabbed at random from a stack of economists that I haven't somehow gotten to the laundromat yet. It's about a fish called Benson, and it was the best loved fish in England, and it died on July 29th at age 25. I could read all of that to you about a fish called Benson, but I'd rather tell you a story about the time I was in England, in Cambridge, as a matter of fact, and they had a fish pool out in front of the school. It was Churchill College. And one day I came back from a long ride with my friend, and there were people fishing in the fish pond. And we couldn't figure out why there was anybody fishing in the fish pond. It was a man-made fish pond. It was rectangular. In fact, there were two rectangular fish ponds, and in between these was a walkway. And the man actually was sent by the government to remove the fishies from the fish pond and count them because a crane had been coming and eating the fishies. And this was according to the porter at Churchill College. And that's the way the English operate, you know. We had been to a place called Wandleberry, and one of the wildlife listed at Wandleberry was a vole and a beetle. So you might get the idea that maybe there's a deeper joke behind the name of that famous mop top crew from long ago and fall away. This hat belongs to the Department of Transportation and I'm not so sure it's legal for me to have it. It belongs to a guy named Nate and it stayed in my car after I found it frozen to the shoreline at Myers Point on Cayuga Lake. It's given me a certain comfort on days when parking my car and walking around and taking pictures. I'm sometimes in a place I don't belong, you know? But if you're in a place where you don't belong and you're taking pictures, say, it helps to have an orange hat on from the DOT. It gives you some authority, you see. People will just drive by and go, oh, he's got an orange hat on. He must be doing something important, or at least he's at work. When in fact, I was just taking a picture of abstract arrangements of trees and rocks. I want to go back to something we all knew about that was in the news not long ago. Lynn's sanity. You know, he's gone now, Jeremy Lin. I don't think he'll be back. There was a brief, shining moment in his life where he was incredibly famous. And now, a lot of people have been born since Jeremy Lin had his great moment with the New York Knicks. And he's been forgotten. That reminds me that the other night, I was coming home from a NBA playoff basketball game. This is a product placement for Moxie Cola, non-diet. And on the way home, I was thinking about how Rajon Rondo had just had the best game of his NBA career. He piled up an amazing 44 points against the Miami Heat, and his team lost. He had the best game of his career. He had the best moment of his life, and his team lost. I don't know why this bothered me so much. It shouldn't have. Sometimes I'm bothered by things that I should just let go of. I guess I have this old American sense of fairness that never existed in the first place. It's always been a concept. Anyway, I was driving in the dark, new McMansion suburbs of Lansing, 
tiny town satellite of Lansing, New York, and a blur darted out from under the hedgerow, and it was a rabbit. And though I still retain the cat-like reflexes I once had as a young man, myself a basketball player, I couldn't avoid the rabbit. Or maybe it was that the rabbit couldn't avoid my car. There was that clunking noise that those of you who have hit animals on the road might be familiar with. And I felt sick to my stomach. Where had my thoughts been just moments before about a young man who's paid millions of dollars to play a kid's game, racking up the most points he ever racked up in his life and yet his team losing. And here I am going home, wondering where my next penny is gonna come from. And instead of paying attention to things as I should have, and I was driving under the speed limit, mind you, I hit a rabbit. Now look, I care about things like that. It makes a difference to me. I got out of my car and I found said rabbit. It was still breathing. Its heart was still beating. I lifted the furry bunny, carried him over to the edge of the road and lay him onto the cool, cool grasses where just moments before he had been Oh, doing his hippity-hoppity thing. And I, and I held my hand over his heart. You know, rabbits are prey animals. And when they get scared, they go into terrible shock. Terrible, terrible shock. And it's this shock, often, more than the injury itself, that leads to their death. Well, how long can you stay by the side of the road with a rabbit? I don't know. I wasn't keeping time. I wasn't keeping time. I was in no time. I mumbled something that I imagined might be a prayer for a rabbit about to perish. An unusual thing to do, I admit. But I did it. And I went home but I didn't sleep. I stayed awake and I thought about that rabbit and I thought about that rabbit and it was Chad Coles right there. Chad Coles of Tiny Town Times, Ad Q, Accounts Receivable and other sundry duties as may apply, who calmed me down and said, listen, sometimes rabbits like yourself are just self-destructive and they fling themselves at automobiles. They want to be here some days about as much as you do. Well, this was, this was not something I needed to hear just then. I, I, I needed some sort of comfort. I needed, I needed, I don't know. That's the way my nerves felt. So I got in my car and I grabbed an LED light and I went back to Lansing. I lived downtown, so it was quite a drive, and it was late. It was about 2.30 in the morning, and I went back and I found that rabbit. And I put that rabbit, I put that rabbit, folks, alive in a Wegmans bag, a cloth Wegmans bag. I never thought that this Wegmans bag would ever become a receptacle, or let's just say a, a sort of litter for an injured animal. And I took it home, and I transferred it to a cat carrier. And I laid the cat carrier out with lots of grass and some grated carrots that were there for the coleslaw and grunion I was gonna have for lunch the next day. And would you believe, in the morning, up in the attic, that rabbit was still alive. I named that rabbit Ray John, after Ray John Rondo. And after many unbearable hours, 
I finally found a place to take it. The Cornell Wildlife Rehabilitation Clinic on Hungerford Hill off Snyder Road. And I haven't had the, I don't know what it is, I haven't had the, the guts, I guess, to call back to find out if the rabbit is still alive. This has got to be some of the worst tasting stuff and worst stuff for you that's made and sold over the counter. The Galilean thermometer is likewise related to something grievous and sad. And I'm not so sure I want to go into it here. But it belonged to a man who recently passed away. It was near and dear to me and to a lot of people in this area. A moment then, my good friend and former employer, Paul Bartoshevitz. This was in his office, and it was a token or a memento of sorts, I guess, for having helped write his obit. So, there's all kinds of crap around our houses. What other kind of crap? Let's say, what other kind of crap? In my house, there's a lot of literary crap, like uh, Aunt Becky's Army Life. Now, before I tell you a little bit about Aunt Becky's army life, it's important to know that this book's been sitting around my house for about 16 or 17 years. It's a reprint, and it's about a nurse who served for the 109th New York Volunteer Regiment during the Civil War. And it is full of grotesque scenes inside the Civil War field surgeon's tent. And it is written in a kind of high, lofty manner that we're not accustomed to nowadays. Many a one rose to be a hero who, if the war of the rebellion had never cursed us, would have remained as commonplace at home as the humblest day laborer, who eats his bread and by the sweat of his brow. The heroism was in the occasion, and the man's heart met it without quailing, and forthwith became a hero. Well, you don't run into that many nurses these days with that kind of English grammar under their gowns, do you folks? Or do you folks? Or simply, do you folks? No. Nope. Folks back then, by the time they were in eighth grade, could write a pretty strong sentence. When I was in eighth grade, I couldn't write a damn thing. In fact, a lot of folks were worried about what was going to happen to me. And they had good reason to be worried, because I was a worrisome young fellow. I'm going to pause here for a moment, because I actually need some liquid refreshment of a non-flavored type. Product placement number three or four, if you're counting, Poland spring water unflavored. I once took it with the essence in it. I once was a big fan of the Mandarin essence flavored water. I am no longer. Oh, this is exactly what they didn't want to have happen, and that's why I'm here. Along this lake, this withered sedge, palely loitering, and hear no birds singing. Anyway, I hope in a second to, to quench and slake my little thirst I've developed here. I'm trying to come up with things to say. Things to say on Mike's show. Mike's show, which I've never been on before, never seen before, know very little about. You know what's on my wrist? I know you're dying to know what's on my wrist. This here is a dog clicker. They use it for training dogs. Training dogs. They use this to train dogs. They train them, say hip, sit. There's a treat. Actually, it's a little more elaborate than that, isn't it? I walk dogs for a while, the SPCA. Let's just say, at the SPCA of Tompkins County, great place, wonderful to walk dogs. You know, dogs greet you 
the same no matter who you are at any given moment, what mood you're in, they're the same. They don't change their dispositions for anyone. Me, I'm kind of a chameleon. You know, I meet somebody I think I should be a little bit serious with and, and I put on a little bit of a serious tone, you know? And I meet somebody who I think is a little cool or street and I, I get a little, get a little down. Or I see somebody on the street and they look like they might be wanting to rough it up with me and I go, oh, man, don't you mess with me. I was told once, incorrectly, that if you're crazy, people will leave you alone. That's not right. If you're crazy, people will find you, and eventually, your life will be marginalized according to the level of your craziness. Oh, well. You know what I liked in school? Were these little music series books. ABC books, they were called. Music for Young Americans. I'm a terrible sight reader, so I won't try to sing any of these songs. But here's one called My Song. And with this instrument that I know so very little about, it just happens to be sitting in my attic. Lord knows why, we hope. I'm gonna sing it for you. There's a tune in my heart that goes round and round. There's a song with the swing, it's a rollicking thing. It's a song I could hum all day long. Don't you remember those days? Rainy day gym class, sitting around. Teacher brought out the book. Well, this was back in the uh, scary post-Eisenhower era, after Sputnik. And we were all terribly frightened of the Russians now, weren't we? Now we're just worried about cyber attacks and drones and drilling outside of the Pyramid Studio. We hope that that incident, uh, which I shall not go into politics here, but that incident in particular is resolved with respect to the party involved. You know, because back in 1980, I recorded a famous tune there you probably never heard it. Its fame came and went like Linsanity. It was called Coffee Pot. And it was a jolly rollicking little tune. And I imagined myself a musician at the time. And it went something like this. Coffee Pot, how I love you so. Get me up in the morning when I'm feeling low. You get me up when I'm low. Mom is up, she's got her own special cup. And pops up too, he reading the news. He got his own special cup, it says, Dad on the front. Hey, look, dear, you on the stove, a poik, poik, poik. And over to after nine, you know my alarm clock's not working. What makes gossip so merry? At the ladies' auxiliary, makes profundity hatch. Hey, in every car, if you clutch. You know they gotta drink a batch to chit chat, chit chat, chit. And in my dreams I see, floating through the air, made of pyrex stainless steel and shiny corning wear. Dancing, smiling, coffee pots all over, everywhere. There are other sections to that song, but that's about the gist of it. I recorded it with the help of a friend of mine in that studio, Pyramid Studio, that belongs to Alex Perriot in the summer of 1980. That's a little tiny town trivia for you. How'd you like that, boy? How'd you like that? I want to point out something to you over there on that music stand there. That's a skateboard designed by a young man named Arlo Berletta. And he is connected to Comet Skateboards here in Ithaca. Not here no more. His buddies have taken over. Arlo moved on to Chicago. But he did some fine skateboard designs in his time. Yes, he did. I wouldn't call that one of his better works but I brought it along because, guess what? There's a theme here, right? Crap around the house. Yeah, crap around the house. We're going to crap 
around the house tonight. We're gonna crap, crap, crap till broad daylight. And this, I don't think you can see this too well. Can you? <laughs> oh, there you go. Well, you know what that is? That's Johnny Fuchs. That's right. The Widget Factory here in Ithaca. Ithaca's Museum of Pornography. And guess what he's doing? In his very best French at the time, he's bargaining with an antiques dealer at an open flea market somewhere in Paris in 1984. The fall of 1984 I happened to be in Paris. I wish I could say I had a great time. I wish I could say I knew what had happened. I wish I could say I was a great writer and that that was part of my growing experience and I churned out some of my finest work after that time. But I didn't like that. No, it's more like Franklin's sanity. It came and it went and it meant not much of nothing. Now, well, I'll draw your attention to something else here. Something else you're all gonna find out. If you don't qualify by certain standards in financial institutions, mortgage lending. I didn't have a chance to throw this out. But, oh, but, oh, yeah, stand me corrected, please. Recycle. It's all about the money you make. I was told that if you had, say, hit the jackpot for $50 million, but you were unemployed, you could only be considered as drawing maybe $100 a month from that. I might have gotten it wrong, but that's the way it sounded to me, and it seemed kind of silly. And besides that, I mean, if you had that much money, why would you be going to a bank to buy a house? I don't know. I don't know why you would do such a thing. Some people just need structure. They need that kind of structure. Even people who are writing out and scratching out scratcher cards, they need the structure. Sometimes it's easier to go get a scratcher card than it is to work for an hour sweeping cigarette butts up off the street. I understand that, but I'm not gonna buy a scratcher card. Well, actually, that's a lie, because I was just down at John's Convenience Store not too long ago, folks. Yeah, it's true. And I bought one. I bought a $5 one. Now, I have no business buying $5 scratcher cards. Excuse me. I have no business buying $5 scratcher cards. Well, guess what? It was my lucky day. I won $10. Now, unlike a good scratcher card player, I didn't go back and turn it all in and buy more scratcher cards. I walked away from the table. Every once in a while, I fool myself and do something really sensible. I made $5. I'm not quite sure what I invested it in. Maybe that awful tasting cough syrup. Certainly not the yams, because I've already explained to you that the yams, which come in water and high fructose syrup and sugar, and are not yams already sweet enough, didn't I already say? Sweet, sweet, sweet yams are coming.